Christmas Eve service. And before we begin the program, we usually, uh, tra by tradition, we take this opportunity to uh, express our gratitude, appreciation, love, and thanks to uh, uh, the leaders of our church worship service. Uh, earlier this morning at our first uh, worship service, Walter Houck was pr uh, presented a gift from the congregation, and this is money that the congregation sent in uh, to support this endeavor. Uh, this evening, we're going to recognize, uh, first of all, uh, Eric Sives. Eric Sives. Eric, along with Walter, are our uh, technical people for Zoom. Did I be doing that? If I were there? No. Okay. They, they always do it because they, they run this part. Now, the next <coughs> person is our music director and choir director, Linda DeGroat. Linda, how many years has it been that you've been here? Let's give it nine. Let's give it nine. Nine years. And uh, it's fantastic. This church has had a a history of, of, of fine choral directors and music directors, and Linda's right there on the top right now. We are really doing a, a, a tremendous amount of, of uh, different things with our, with our chor a chorus, and also the music that she plays certainly enhances our worship service. And Linda, uh, you know, we do appreciate what you do. We love you, and we, we thank you very much for how you, uh, along with, of course, the choir. <laughs> enhances the worship service. So thank you very much and let me present to you with a gift of gratitude from the congregation. Thank you very much. And last but not least is our pastor, Pastor Catherine. She's been with us over three years now, right? Almost three. Say, well, let's say over three, just <laughs> to be consistent. Uh, and um, again, we've, we've had our spiritual um, life enhanced by her presentations, by her sermons. She's, with each year, she, she uh, has made us feel more comfortable in the church environment. She's challenged us. She's uh, presented messages that really enable you to think. She's visited members of our congregation, uh, pre presented communion at different times, and many, many things. But most of all, she, she serves as the, the spiritual leader of our church. And uh, she's going on vacation, too. So the presentation will hopefully help you while you're on vacation starting tomorrow. She's not leaving now. Don't worry. OK. I said to Janet, this bow would fall off, I don't know how many times, but it, it's been at least three before I get a chance to present it to you, but thank you so thank much. Thank you. And I wouldn't dream of missing Christmas Eve. <laughs> and with that, let us begin. Oh, oh we got, okay. Uh, she's not here this evening, but our church secretary, Sharon Beauvais. She's the thread that weaves through everybody. She does the bulletin. She handles all of the, uh, all of the workings of correspondence for our church, phone calls first and everything. Her gift was presented uh, yesterday. I, I came in and, and did the ho-ho like I was Santa coming up the stairs. She was here by herself, and I almost had to call the EMTs. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, she survived, and, and uh, she was presented with a gift of gratitude for, for her job. And she's been with us 30 years. Over 30. Years. Over 30. See, we got to be consistent. Over 30 years. <laughs> okay, and we're over time, so I guess we have to, uh, no, we're going to begin at this time. Let us begin with our personal meditation, uh, put our minds uh, in, in concert with the evening and think of the, the beauty of this night. 
At the Nativity of the Lord and throughout the season of Christmas, we give thanks that in the fullness of time, God's word became flesh to live among us, full of grace and truth. This service of nine lessons and carols originates from a 1918 Christmas Eve service at King's College Chapel, University of Cambridge, England. And with that, our prelude, Ding Dong Merrily on High. Hey, I am fired up right now. Our call to worship. Glory to God in the highest. To God's people on earth. Light shines on those who live in the darkness. For, For a, a child, child has been born, born to us this night. night. Let, Let us, us celebrate the birth of our Lord together. together. I would love to invite the candle, lighter, the candle lighting family forward, as well as the choir, to come to the tree. In Advent, we wait for the birth of our Lord and Savior. In Advent, we wait for the coming of our true, true king and ruler of this world. In Advent, we wait for the coming of our true king and world. In Advent, we wait for God's mercy to pour out like a stream. On Christmas Eve night, we light the candle of hope. as we hope for God's goodness to wash over us. We light the candle of peace. As we pray for God's peace to reign over all the earth, we light the candle of joy as we celebrate the gifts of life, love, and light given to us every day. We light the candle of love as we embrace God's love for us through Christ. We light the candle of Christ candle as a sign of Christ coming into the world as an embodiment of hope, peace, joy, and love. Listen to these words from Isaiah. The people who walked in the darkness have seen great light. Those who lived in the land of of deep darkness, on them light has shined. Let, Let us walk, walk in into the light, light of the Lord. Lord. Amen.
Our opening hymn for this evening is O Come All Ye Faithful, number 41. If you are able, please stand as we sing this well-known carol. sinned, not one of us is clean, but there is mercy and love for those who call on the name of the Lord. Trusting in God, in God's grace and love, let us confess our sin using the words from our first reading, Genesis 3 18, 15, and 17 to 19 in the message version of our Bible. Our unison prayer of confession, congregation, see you. When Adam and Eve heard the sound of God strolling in the garden in the evening breeze, the man and his wife hid in the trees of the garden, hid from God. God called man, where are you, he said. I've heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid. God said, who told you that you were naked? Did you eat from that tree I told you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you gave me as a companion, she gave me fruit from the tree, and yes, I ate it. God said to the woman, what is this that you've done? The serpent seduced me, she said, and I ate. God told the serpent, cursed beyond all cattle and wild animals, Cursed to slink on your belly and eat dirt all your life. I'm declaring the war between you and the woman, between you offspring and hers. He'll wound your head, you'll wound his heel. God the man, because you listened to your wife 
and ate from the tree that I commanded not to eat from, don't eat from this tree. The very ground is cursed because of you. Getting food from the ground will be as painful as having babies is for your wife. You'll be working in pain all your life long. The ground will sprout thorns and weeds. You'll get your food the hard way, planting and tilling and harvesting, sweating in the fields from dawn to dusk, until you return to that ground yourself, dead and buried. You started out as dirt, and you will end up as dirt. Thanks be to God. All have sinned, and yet that never changed God's love for humanity. That never changed God's love for you. Christ came as a tiny baby, as the best example in all of history of God's love. It's in Christ that we're made a new creation every day, as fresh as a newborn and just as loved. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Please stand now as you are able in body or spirit for our second carol, which is number nine, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. seated. Our second reading in this of service of lessons and carols, so of readings and then music, our second reading this evening is also from Genesis, this time chapter 22, verses 15 through 18. The angel of the Lord called Abraham a second time from heaven and said, by myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will indeed bless you, and I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars of heaven and as the sands, and, uh, and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of their enemies, and by your offspring shall all the nations of the earth gain blessing for themselves because you have obeyed my voice. 
I now invite the choir forward for our first moment of special music. Reading three can be found on page 555 in your pew Bibles. It comes from Isaiah chapter nine, verse two, and then six and seven. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with the joy in the harvest. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders and his name, the Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, 
Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The word of the Lord. Our next carol is number 38, It Came Upon the Midnight Clear. Please stand as you are able and body your spirit to join in this carol. the book of Isaiah, we will be reading it responsively. So it's in the bulletin. I'll be the leader, and I invite everyone to join me as the people. So with this in mind, it's in the bulletin. And so would you please join me in Isaiah chapter 11. A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest on him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge for the poor and decide with equity for the oppressed of the earth. The wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion shall feed together, and a little child shall lead them. 
The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put its hands on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our next moment is another time of special music. However, it will not be, unfortunately, Sherry singing a Hallelujah Christmas. She is unable to be here tonight. Instead, I will be singing a couple verses of Away in a Manger. So we're missing out on Sherry, but we will have some music in the interim. can be found on page 831, Luke 1, verses 26 to 35, and then verse 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God, and now you will conceive in the womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child will be born, will be holy, and will be called the Son of God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. The word of the Lord. And now for our next carol, you all can remain seated this time, is Hark the Herald Angels Sing, number 31.
reading comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in bands of cloth and laid him in a manger, because there was no place in the guest room. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What a joy to hear that a lovely sweet baby has been born in Bethlehem to a young woman and her doting almost husband. Except, as we know, things aren't quite what they seem with this young couple who are starting a new part of their lives, parenthood. We know things are different because this baby is different. This baby changes the whole world. Now, I've always thought the story in Luke about Jesus' birth is a great depiction. As a child, it's, it's just so vivid, clear, and astonishing. The thing is... The picture we have in our heads about what a manger is like and where it is located isn't quite accurate to first century Bethlehem and that whole region of the world. The manger wasn't kept in a separated barn from the rest of the house. I thought it was like that until I visited the Holy Land back in January of 2017 and had the privilege of going to the cathedral in Bethlehem that's built around the place where Jesus was born. You get the chance to go down to the recesses of the church to see the cave where, tradition says, Jesus was born. The animals were kept inside, off the main living area, but kept inside during the night, kind of like some dogs or cats are indoor-outdoor, you know, like in the daytime outside, but at night they come in to protect them from predators or thieves or whatever. So that's what it was like back then. So the Presbyterian Outlook, which is a magazine, ran an article by Ken Bailey titled, The Manger and the Inn, A Middle Eastern View of the Birth Story of Jesus. 
that talks about this kind of more in depth. And so I'm going to quote a chunk of it now for, y for all of us to hear. In the West, the, tradition te the traditional telling of the birth story of Jesus is overlaid with mythology. I'm not referring to Santa Claus, Snow, Bells, or Rudolph, but rather to our understanding of the biblical text itself. Across the centuries, we have introduced into the scripture itself a remarkable number of mythological elements. Some of these are so old and so pervasive that they're unconsciously affirmed. In the West, we have assumed that there was an inn in the story. Thus, no room in the inn is the traditional translation. The word translated in the Western versions as inn in Luke chapter 2, verse 7, is the Greek word kataluma. But when Luke uses this word, what does he really mean? In the story of the Good Samaritan, the wounded man is clearly taken to a commercial establishment that provides shelter for strangers. However, Luke has the man arrive at a pandokaihoin, not a kataluma. Pandokaihoin is a common Greek word for an inn. Luke knows this word and uses it. So, if for Luke, pandokaihoin means a commercial inn, what does he intend by the word kataluma? A clear answer is visible. The only other case of the use of Cataluma in Luke's gospel is in chapter 22, verse 11, where the disciples are told to follow a man carrying a jug of water and on arrival at his house to ask, where is the Cataluma? Or, in the RSV it's translated, guest room, where I am to eat the Passover with my disciples, and he will show you a large upper room furnished. Here, Cataluma is unambiguously defined. It means a guest room attached to a private home. So Luke indicates a commercial inn with the word pandokahoyan and a private guest room as a kataluma. If then, no room for them in the inn should really be translated no room for them in the guest room. What then of the manger? Now as a short aside, this is not a quote, this is from me. Did you notice that in the new version of the NRSV that I just read, they used the phrase guest room rather than in. End of my little aside. Back to the quote. To answer this question, it is necessary to observe the construction of Palestinian traditional one-room homes. Such buildings are split-level homes. There is a small lower level for the animals at one end. And then about 80% of the one room is on a terrace level on which the family cooks, eats, and lives. The two levels are connected by a short set of stairs. Into the lower level, the family cow, donkey, and a few sheep are brought each night. In the morning, these animals are taken out into a courtyard, the area is cleaned, and the house is ready for the day. This is a critical piece of evidence that unlocks Luke 2 verse 7. What is unknown to the Western reader is the fact that in a traditional Palestinian home, the mangers are in the living room. Now all the parts of the story fall into place. The text Luke found in the tradition was originally written for a Palestinian reader who starts with the assumptions that mangers are in the living room and guest rooms are attached to one-room homes and are used only for guests. With this in mind, the text says, And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. The reader instinctively asks, Manger? Oh, they are in the main family room. Why not the guest room? And so the author instinctively senses the above question and replies, Because there is no room for them in the guest room. The reader concludes, Ah, oh, I see. The guest room was full. Never mind. The family room is more appropriate anyway. That's the end of the quote. So the narrative Luke tells us makes so much more sense with that background. The manger is part of the main house, and normally guests would stay in a guest room off the main, family's, off the main family dwelling, but the guest room was already full. And so the family, the two of them, almost three, 
was offered the living room, just like we do today, right? Like if you have a lot of people coming over and all the bedrooms are full, oh, you can take the couch, right? It's the same kind of thing. This narrative shows us just how human Jesus was. He was born to a peasant couple and lived in humble surroundings. The king of kings was born into simplicity with the greatest of ministries still to come. Not to rule people with an iron fist, but to welcome all people into the family of God. We're here celebrating his birth tonight because Jesus Christ was born as a baby who defied all cultural expectations and continued to live that way throughout his entire life. God embraced God's people and the whole human experience by becoming one of us. I often talk about the topsy-turvy kingdom of God and the birth of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, starts off this topsy-turvy kingdom where the least are the greatest. A poor woman brings forth into the world a tiny baby. This happens day in and day out. And yet that one night in Bethlehem, centuries ago, when the city was bursting to the seams, that all the guest rooms of all the relatives of Joseph were full, and they ended up in a living room. A baby was born that changed the course of human experience for the better. What a gift the birth of Christ is. A gift that brings us true hope and peace and joy and love. As you leave this worship space to celebrate Christmas, I pray that you see the shimmers of God's presence among you in the faces of your loved ones and your traditions. And remember, God loves you, loves us, and loves the whole world. It's our job to rejoice however we can at the birth of Christ, our Lord and Savior. Some years the rejoicing will come naturally, and other years you'll hardly feel any joy at all. The beauty of Jesus Christ's human experience is that God knows what it feels like to be human. God knows the ups and downs of human life, and so... God knows that some years rejoicing at Christ's birth looks like tears of grief over a lost loved one. The true gift of Christmas can and does hold whatever feelings we have within ourselves and takes us up to find our true hope, peace, joy, and love in him. So friends, let us share these gifts to the whole world, for the world has been changed because of him. Amen. For our next reading, this will be done, once again, you'll need your bulletins, or you'll need to look at the screen. We'll be doing it responsively. So, if you're on the pulpit side, which is my side, uh, you get to read with me. If you're on the organ side, that's Rich's side. Thank you, Rich, for the direction. If you're on Rich's side, the organ side, you get to read with him. Those of you on Zoom or participating in worship later on YouTube, pick a side that you feel like reading and go with it. But please, if you're on Zoom, make sure you're muted. Thank you. Okay, so here we go. Are we ready for Luke 2, verses 8 through 16? I hope you are, because I am. Now, in that same region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then the angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts 
praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So, so they, they went, went with, with haste, haste and found Mary, Mary and Joseph and, Joseph and the, the child, child lying in, in the manger. manger. Now with this exciting news in mind, let us stand together in body or spirit for our next carol, number 40, Joy to the World. As an aside, when I was a camper, they had us in a mess hall, and they divide us like we were divided, and we had to scream these cheers and see if we could get the lights to sway. So I was looking to see if, I think they were swaying when you sang that song. So that was really, really cool. Okay, let us move on. Reading number eight is from Matthew 2, verses 1 through 11, found on page 783. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star in the, in the rising, at its rising, and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them, where the Messiah was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from him you sh shall come a ruler, with, who, is, uh, who is the shepherd, my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men, and learned from them the exact time where the star appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. 
When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went to the, uh, went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary's mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. The word of the Lord. We will now have a time of prayer. And at the end of the prayer, we will be praying the Lord's Prayer. It is not printed in the bulletin, but if that's something you would like to read along as we all say it together, in our hymnal at the very front, right next to hymn number one, the Lord's Prayer that we'll be saying is at the top of the page. So if that's something you would like to read along with when we get to that part of the prayer, that's where you can find it. And our prayer this evening was not written by me. It was written by a man named Jeremy Wilhelmy. So with this in mind, let us join our hearts in prayer. Come alive, O Christ, in the weary parts of our souls, in the war-torn countries fraught with fear, in the ailing bodies whose prognoses are grim, so that the hope bursts out through our despair. Come alive, O Christ, in the storms that overwhelm our souls with anxiety, in the homes and neighborhoods hampered with violence, in the eyes of those who blindly hate their neighbor, so that peace calms the reckless rage that bloodies our lands. Come alive, O Christ, in the lonely world of selfishness, in the scarred minds of those who think life has no meaning, in the grief of loved ones lost, so that joy rekindles generosity, purpose, and gratitude. Come alive, O Christ, in the broken places where reconciliation seems unattainable, in the communities devoid of connection and kinship, in the spaces where neglect, apathy, and abuse harm far too many, so that love, love, love overwhelms all hearts fills every gap, and changes the world for good. Come alive, O Christ, so that your light may dwell in us and shine forever and ever. Come alive, O Christ, as we pray once more the prayer that you taught us to pray as we say the Lord's Prayer together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's now time where we will take our offering.
please join me in our unison prayer of dedication. God of abundant gifts, we thank you for the gift of your son, for he is the best gift we can receive. Help us to be more generous with our abundant blessings given to us in Christ. Use these gifts given tonight as a sign and symbol of your continued presence in this world today. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Our ninth reading for the night comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overtake it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light, so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of the blood, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. We will now have what is frankly my favorite time in our service, we have our candle lighting. So if you do not have a candle, the ushers will gladly bring you one. The way this works, oh, we, we have an important person who needs a candle. <laughs> the way this works, Rich and I will take our candles, we'll light them from the Christ candle, and then we'll head down the aisle, and the people in the pews get to share the light of Christ. If you have lit your, if your candle is lit, you stay upright. The person who has an unlit candle will tilt their candle to you. So you never tilt a lit candle. You keep it, what is this, vertical. And then the unlit candle will come and be lit. Feedback. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. As we are lighting the candles, we'll dim the lights. We will sing Silent Night together, which is number 60. Uh, but before the congregation sings Silent Night, Heath will sing the first verse of Stille Nacht for us. And then once he is done with Stille Nacht, we will all sing the, the verses of Silent Night. And I believe we will sing the first verse a second time in English. We'll sing all our verses in English. Um, this will, after we sing the three verses, we'll sing the first verse again with our candles lit to bring in the light of Christ into the darkness of winter. So with this, let us start the candle lighting.
Merry Christmas. Go in peace.